Dennis Law, the reluctant match winner, the man who ironically sinks Manchester United. And a warm welcome again to the big match. And so the Football League season, or at least the last full Saturday of it, ends on another high and controversial note. The sadness of seeing a club like Manchester United relegated to the second division is more than matched by the shame brought upon them by a section of their fans yesterday with that mindless invasion of the pitch that caused the match against Manchester City to be abandoned just before the end. You can see those scenes again today. And indeed how Birmingham City made sure of first division survival in their match against Norwich. And our bonus match is the match at the top of the third division between York City and Oldham. Today is also the day when we announce the winning order in our Golden Goals competition. And indeed, the Golden Goals panel has been meeting this week. From the left, Vic Railton of the Evening News, Mick Shannon of Southampton, Malcolm Allison, and Bernard Joy of the Evening Standard. Uh, our winning viewer will be here. So, too, will be the man who scored our winner of 1974. We shall also be talking to the new Footballer of the Year, Ian Callaghan. And we make the draw for the London Five-A-Side Championship, which is to be played at Wembley on Wednesday. A full programme, indeed. But first, it's action. And for a start, it's Manchester United against Manchester City, and we join Gerald Sinstat at Old Trafford. A tense and emotional welcome for Manchester United, who have just taken the field, knowing that a 36-year unbroken run in the First Division could be coming to an end after 90 minutes of the 90th Manchester derby. An emotional afternoon, certainly, and one can only speculate at the thoughts in the minds of the players. Men like Alex Stepney, the only survivor of the 1968 European Cup winners team. Willie Morgan, the ninth Manchester derby for him today, and only once on the winning side. Lou Macari, brought down from Scotland for £200,000 to help shape the new United. Brian Greenoff, who's had to grow up as a footballer in a side haunted by its past. And what can be the thoughts today of Dennis Law, the erstwhile king of the Stretford end, one of the few men to have played on both sides of this game, now returning for probably his last competitive match at Old Trafford where he knew so many glories and so many triumphs, and maybe now to make a contribution towards his old team's relegation. Well, let's take a check on the two lineups. Manchester United, unchanged. Tommy Doherty has faith in the side, beaten at Goodison Park on Tuesday, the setback which has made life so difficult for them today. Mick Martin, the substitute. And Manchester City, they too are unchanged for their last game of the season. Rodney Marsh, who's had a cartilage operation, might have been in this game, but he turned an ankle over in training yesterday, and so the question never arose. Willie Morgan and Dennis Law, two Scots, the skippers, both no doubt aware that one of the minor issues, though not so minor for those involved this afternoon, is that Willie Orman, the Scottish team manager, is in the stand. Eight Scottish internationals in this match for Scythe, Holton, Buchan, Morgan, Macari and McCalliog for United and Donachie and Law for City. 62,000 people in the ground making the total at all matches here at Old Trafford this season more than a million. The support of the faithful unshakable and our referee is mr david smith from stonehouse in gloucestershire it'll be manchester city to kick off the blues against the reds the blues attacking the goal to our left and of course it's results in other matches which are important in united's bid to stay in the first division but what is certain is that if they don't win here the results of those matches will have no bearing at all. United, with one game to play after this, that's at Stoke, must win, even if the other clubs are to help them. 
Dennis Law and Holton going in hard on to Lee Bell and Doyle Barrett Stewart flicking it Holton and back to step for Seif he was in sharply enough then and Bell then Somerby tackled by McCallie Donachy, Law, Alton threading it out to Daly, that's for McCall from McElroy, Morgan, Forsyth, good burst by Forsyth, and good covering back by Colin Bell. there before McElroy but at the expense of a call Morgan taking it quickly getting it back from Dale that will be corner number three in this game all of them to Manchester United and this time Morgan to take the deep one was there, didn't make contact that's McCallion's header and off the line by Donachy turned in again by Houston anybody's, hooked away by Lee but that was a beautiful cross and a good header from McCallion Manchester City saved by Willie Donachy it's a free kick now for a foul given to Manchester United and suddenly the game has warmth and passion Plenty of men to aim at, not least Jim Holton. Got ahead to it, but couldn't do anything. Doyle. Daly. Oh, he's made some room now. Good header! Sammy McElroy disappointed. Made good contact. But the angle was difficult. Bell. Barrett. Summerby to Stewart. For Oaks. Well might the crowd ooh. That shot was as close as most that City have had. Ball went out. And there's the half-time whistle. And Manchester United and Manchester City go in halfway through this most vital of Manchester derbies with a blank score sheet. United having certainly not looked like the struggling side they were a couple of months ago. And on the balance of this first half, certainly a better side than Manchester City. They've undoubtedly created the more chances, but City, of course, dangerous on the break. But they go in now to think over a blank score sheet. Nil-nil at Old Trafford, but with Birmingham, Southampton and West Ham all leading at half-time, Manchester United will have no illusions about the task ahead of them in these last 45 minutes. Houston. This is Lee. Law. Summerby. Oaks. Stewart. Out to Donachy.
Bell. Oaks. It's a United ball. Daly now. That was back into trouble, really. Morgan Howard has Donerke to beat. McCallion. McElroy trying to turn, but Booth gets the ball out. And off the flag for a corner. Holton under this yet again. And off the line by Barrett. The shot was Daly's, I think. It was in the end probably McElroy who got in there and was given a lot of time to turn. And Barrett, I believe, whose header it was off the line. Kaliog and now McElroy. Kaliog again for Seif. It's to be yet another cross, but this time on the ground. Daly, Green off. And that sets McElroy through. Little turn and push through by Green off. Gave Sammy McElroy the ball for his left foot. Some of it. A cross field, a beautiful ball for Stewart. Can he make it tell? Pulled across for Lee and he couldn't reach it. Manchester City potentially so dangerous on the break. Colin Barrett from Manchester City. Their corner. Some of his corner. Stewart setting himself and putting it over Stepney's head against the bar. Well, that was the biggest let off for United so far. Stewart measured his shot to the inch, or maybe not quite to the inch. Houston. Kaliog robbed by Lee. Back heel for Bell. Dennis Stewart now with Donerke going outside him. Law, Summerby and Lee on or around the edge of the penalty area. Summerby for Stewart. Oh, he really had a go again then. And Stepney got down to cover. Twice in a matter of a minute or so, Dennis Stewart foiled. First by the woodwork, the second time by Stepney. Good catch by the Manchester United goalkeeper. Forsyth. Donerke's clearance, too strong and too high for Lee. Forsyth for United. To Buchan, with Law coming to make him hurry. Morgan. Doyle. Some of these slotting it through nicely for Bell. Stewart is away on the left. Lee. 
Pulled across for Law! Dennis has done it! And no elation there at all from Dennis Law. He'll not have scored a cheekier goal on this ground where he's seen so many triumphs. Just look at that little back heel. We've got an invasion of the pitch that we could well do without. Referee is wanting to take the players off. There are officials down on the touchline talking to him. And the pitch rapidly clearing. Tommy Doherty and Tony Book in conversation down on the line. It surely is over now. And Dennis is going to come off. Farewell to Old Trafford. And Dennis leaves the scene, almost certainly for the last time at Old Trafford. The substitute on is Phil Henson, 21 years old, playing for the first time in league football. Henson. Fouled by Somerby. Looks as though we've got flower bombs or something being thrown from the Stratford end now. smoke of some kind coming from behind that goal police are there in numbers play going on and about five minutes to go because I guess the referee will add something on for the pitch invasion Houston back to him we've got a spectator on the pitch Well, this is not a very happy day for Manchester, whichever side of the fence you sit on. And one could do with Manchester supporters not to let down the name of the city. We've got two more on the pitch, one at, one at each end. Martin Buchan leading one away. Still smoke eddying out from behind the goal as play restarts. Difficult for the players to keep concentration in circumstances like this. Referee having words with the Manchester City bench for something. Barrett to Lee. Holton holding him off and getting the ball back to Stepney. Bucker for Scythe. Booth. Booth coming away with the ball. And we've now got fans on the field again, spilling over from the corner on my right. And I suspect that... Uh, we shall see the referee calling the players off. Yes, he's taking them off. We have, in fact, had 45 minutes in this game, and I don't see him bringing them back on. So that, presumably, is the end of the game. And apart from 45, 90 minutes at Stoke on Monday, the end of Manchester United's 36 years unbroken run in the first division sent there by the last kick that Dennis Law 
is likely to take on this field. And the end of a sad, sad season for Manchester United. And we've got another invasion of the pitch. And the season at Old Trafford, not so much ending as disintegrating. Loyalty is one thing, but without discipline, it so easily becomes a shambles. And now a police cordon marches on and the rabble retreat. Well, just what the punishment for those scenes will be, we can only wait and see. But of course, United's immediate punishment is relegation to the second division. And Gerald Sinsat asked the Manchester United manager, Tommy Doherty, for his reaction to that. Obviously very difficult, they're a very young side. Uh, even the older players are obviously very upset. I myself, very, I'm very upset. I'm upset for the players because they've given so much. I'm upset for the uh, directors and the supporters because I feel very ashamed and very embarrassed to, 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 to be in this position. There is no doubt about it in my mind that everyone that plays against Manchester United, they play twice as hard and run twice as fast. And they all like to beat us and they all like to bring us down. And this is a difficult thing to overcome. Uh, you get, how could Everton beat us then beat Southampton 3-0? It's just not on. And this is the type of thing that happens. And I feel very sorry for them because they've given so much and no manager could have asked for more than uh, than I've got from these fellas. What did you say to them when they came in? Well, I couldn't speak for a change. You know, it's, it's very, as you say, it's very embarrassing. Uh, in as much as what can you say? You know, we've been lifting them all season and they've responded magnificently. And uh, it's very difficult. Young players don't realise probably the seriousness of it. What about your own fans, Tom? This tremendous loyalty and enthusiasm they have for you, and yet at times it embarrasses you when it gets out of hand like today. They never embarrass me. They're great supporters. And uh, uh, today's incident, uh, I was here last year, and Mr. Olive said to me, be prepared at the end of the game, Tom, they come running on the pitch, pick up pieces of, gra pieces of grass, and, uh, and they probably thought it was time up today, and they ran onto the pitch. Uh, uh, the pitch. It wasn't the right thing to do. I'm not... I'm not uh, saying it was. It was unfortunate. Uh, there was some injury time, I believe, which, you know, I was a bit surprised. But I'm not the timekeeper. The referee was in a very mm. difficult position. I certainly position. thought there were a few, a few minutes to go. Yes, the referee he had a very difficult job to do, and so, so did the Chief of Police. And uh, this is what I feel. It's, you know, it's very, very difficult. And uh, since the Nottingham Forest match, of course, uh, this is the second, I think, second or third time it's happened. And unless something's done, of course, it's going to happen a lot, uh, a lot more. A couple of points, I think, that need to be made after Tommy Doherty has said that the fans may have thought that the final whistle had gone. If this were the case, surely when Sir Matt Busby appealed to them to leave the pitch, as he did, that they would have done so, particularly in the face of such a strong force of policemen. And secondly, after all, what was there for the United fans to go onto the pitch to celebrate in any case? Now, I believe the solution is clearer than ever, that fans at bigger games like this have simply got to be fenced in. Uh, we said it on this programme after the Newcastle affair. We'd repeat it again now, after all. It happens in Holland, it happens in Germany, it happens in Italy, it happens right through South America. And please don't say to me, that's all very well for those volatile foreigners, but not for us. After this season, I don't think we can ever say that again. We take a break now. After it, we're going to show you how Birmingham survived. Who has won the Golden Goals? Meet the man who did it and the new Footballer of the Year, Ian Callaghan. Watch us make the draw for the London Five-A-Side Championships at Wembley this Wednesday. That comes up after the break.
Big Match, part two, production number 4818, recorded 28th of April 74, take one. And welcome back. More action now as we pick up perhaps the most crucial game of the weekend. The game that decided everything at the bottom of the first division. Birmingham City needed to beat Norwich City to make sure of staying up themselves and send Manchester United and Southampton down. So it's Birmingham against Norwich from ATV. The commentator is Hugh Johns and Birmingham are in the dark shirts. Gordon Taylor leaves the ball for Campbell. Hatton now. Campbell. Bad ball. Suggett has it. Grapes quickly for Boyer, and Grapes got it late then from Gary Pendry. And already the tensions that one expected to see in this game coming right up to the surface here. First bit of treatment required then. Trevor Francis, who got back on the goals trail again in these recent matches, and Birmingham are delighted about that. Suggett then is preparing to take this kick. So Butler number two is there as well. Suggett's kick. That was a good try and a great goal! Well, that was a shock! Strenner, a surprise goal from Suggett's free kick. That's Steele. Boyer, Norwich still causing Birmingham an awful lot of trouble. Roberts as far as Taylor. Campbell. And again, Norwich tapping back quickly. Roberts for Pendry. Not allowing Birmingham to dwell on the ball. Good jump by Burns. Butler knocks it out. Hind on the jump against McDougall. Now Francis. Benson going with him. Checked well. And it'll come for Taylor. Now Hatton. Taylor. Good try. Beautiful save. Wonderful shot from Gordon Taylor. And an absolutely magnificent reflex save from Kevin Keelan. Hatton. Roberts as Norwich come out. McDougal the flick on, and Boyer's own side because he was in his own half anyway, cutting in on goal, looks up to see where McDougal is, tremendous run back and tackle by Roger Hind, Roger Hind the hero then against that run of Boyer's. Well Boyer thought he was getting a corner out of it, Latchford had come to get the ball having been assured by the referee that it was in fact a goal kick. time Roberts gets gold side of him. Pendry is there as well. That's McDougall! Ted McDougall very nearly sneaking one then on the near post. Boyer the man setting it up. Francis for Burns. Too strong. Aim for Kendall comes to Martin. Francis now. Benson backpedalling. Not a bad cross, too close to the goalkeeper. For a moment I thought a foul had been given, but uh, no, the ball was all right. Roberts in hard. Hatton, square for Kendall. Burns, Kendall, that's Hatton going into the box. He was off balance. A great appeal for a penalty that Butler was pushing him. But not given. 
Goal kick. Very difficult to tell in that situation. Frankly, from up here, I thought that uh, Hatton had, in fact, lost his balance slightly as he cut in on the ball, but the close attentions of Butler had certainly put uh, Hatton off. Hind forward. Stringer gets it away. Roberts. Now Burns. Clearance only goes as far as Kendall. Hatton stretched wide on the left. Trying the shot. Oh, what a goal! How is it possible to get that one in there? Bob Hatton, the scorer, equalises. And for the first time, Birmingham spectators are on their feet, applauding this moment. Just over 40 minutes of the first half played, and Hatton equalises. It did not seem possible that Hatton could squeeze that shot in on the near post, but there was a gap. Keelan had left the gap and had capitalised on it. And now the sound roars around the St Andrews ground. Now the tension has been relieved a little. Campbell following this attack in. But he jumped well, and it was noticeable at that time, Keelan stayed on his line. So, a new game. Second forward for Boyer. Sissons. It's wide for McDougall. Benson. Francis rubs him. A little bit of up tennis growing into it. Hind whacking it forward for Birmingham. Hatton's there. Forbes gets it away. Only as far as Burns. Stretched wide now for Taylor. Going against uh, Butler. Look for Burns! It's there! It's given! Yes, indeed! Burns has made it 2-1! With still about two minutes to go. The half drive. Burns, the man who's just been voted the West Midlands Footballer of the Year, puts Birmingham in front 2-1. Well, there's a double blow for Norwich. The attack building up. Campbell stretching it wide to Taylor. The cross ball. And Burns in behind everybody with a beautiful headed goal. That was the victory that kept uh, Birmingham City into the first division. There was a certain amount of discussion, certainly amongst the Norwich defenders, as to whether that uh, second goal uh, by Kenny Burns there was offside. I think if we look at it again, we'll see that in fact it was a very good refereeing decision. As uh, Taylor puts that ball in, you can just see in the top of the picture, I hope you can see that at home, the legs there of Kenny Burns. And he is behind that last defender, and there's a goalkeeper there as well, so he's in a perfectly good onside position, a beautiful goal, and an excellent decision there by the linesman. So Birmingham then are safe, but now it's time to meet the Footballer of the Year. And you've probably read this morning that it's Ian Callaghan of Liverpool, who's won the Premier Award from the Football Writers Association, been going since about 1947-48. Uh, and this is how we surprised Ian with the news when he came into our World of Sports studio yesterday. Ian Callaghan, welcome again to the World of Sports studio. You think you're here to do an on-the-ball interview, but in fact we've got a very pleasant surprise for you, which will come to you from Mike Langley, who is chairman of the Football Writers Association. Here's Mike. Ian Callaghan, you are the Footballer of the Year. Oh, gee, thank you very much. <laughs> and you surprise. can't take this away now, Ian, but it's what I'm going to present you with on Thursday night. Yeah, at uh, the Bloomsbury Centre. You'll be the oh, first, fantastic. not only the first Liverpool player, uh, but I think one of the very few who's played such a long career. 652 games without a Quite booking, a never been sent off, and completely in the precept of the original award. Somebody said a wonderful example off the field, and I think everyone is very, very pleased for you. Oh, fantastic, so yes. So if you'd lovely. like to show that perhaps to the viewers. and. 
Right. There you are. But Mike, I know, has got to get off to a game, so you've got to give that back to yeah. Mike. <laughs> Take it away. I'll see you on Thursday. Thursday yeah. Yeah. Ian Callaghan, the Footballer of the Year. But our bonus match today is the vital one in the third division where York City needed one point from their home game against Oldham to win promotion to the second division with Oldham and Bristol Rovers. York City here are in the white shorts. The pictures come from Yorkshire Television and Keith Macklin is the commentator. Despite having to face this pretty powerful breeze, are continuing to attack. Swallow and straight into the arms of Ogden. Burrows. Back goes Edwards. Seal to cover the goalkeeper. Edwards has to turn. Jones. Getting behind York City now. Chris Jones gets it across well, but there'd been an offence. The arm held up for the indirect free kick inside the area. Mr. Bose is standing a foot or so inside the area with his arm raised for the indirect free kick. A lot of players in the penalty area. A goal! The goalkeeper standing still. It looks like Chris Jones has scored it. That looks like Chris Jones' 20th goal of the season. It is indeed. Chris Jones standing on mark from that indirect free kick. And Ogden couldn't move, so York City take the lead coming to Butler Woodward bit of elbowing free kick to Oldham Athletic Holmes being told to retire quickly taken by Groves to Whittle and that rebounded off Seal Jimmy Seal belting that up the touch line and it just rolls into touch. Jimmy Seal. Whittle the throw to Robbins. Edwards. Clipped up for Jones. More pushing. Going, Burrows penalised the free kick outside the area. It was a free kick that brought York City's goal. Now Oldham Athletic look for an equaliser. A most thrilling second half we're having at Bootham. There's the wall. And Whittle again, curling it against our goal! It's a beautifully flighted goal by Whittle. And he's so delighted, he curled that beautifully. It hit the post and bounced the right way for Oldham Athletic. So, Morris Whittle gets his 10th goal of the season with a beautifully flighted free kick to make the score 1-1 and Oldham back in the game. That's how it finished 1-1. York and Oldham then go into the second division next season with Bristol Rovers. Uh, before we go on, a word about a couple of testimonials this week in London. Eddie McCready, that great old Chelsea stalwart, uh, he's got one on Wednesday night. Chelsea against Manchester United at Stamford Bridge at 7 o'clock. And then Ron Hunt of Queen's Park Rangers, a QPR against Crystal Palace. That's at Loftus Road on Friday at 7.30. Eddie McCready then on Wednesday, Ron Hunt on Friday. Two fellows who really are worthy of a little bit of support. And talking about Crystal Palace, you may have heard that they need to beat Cardiff by three goals to nil uh, at Ninian Park on Tuesday night in order to survive into the second division. I can only say that our mathematicians have also been doing a bit of work and it's better news for Crystal Palace fans because we maintain that if Palace win one nil at Ninian Park on Tuesday that'll be good enough for them to survive in the second division. 
But now on the program, it's time for Golden Goals. And today is the day when we name the winning order and the winning viewer as well. Uh, the Golden Goals panel met this week to decide uh, the order of merit. A panel that consists of uh, our guest this season, of course, is Mick Shannon of Southampton. Also on the panel, we've got, uh, here he comes now, Malcolm Allison. <laughs> Uh, and following Malcolm Allison on the panel, of course, we have, as usual, Bernard Joy of the Evening Standard and the last member of the panel, Vic Railton of the Evening News. Let's eavesdrop for a moment on their conversation. Mike, can we welcome you first of all, and from a striker's point of view, which of those six marvellous goals did you enjoy most? Well, I think, obviously, the obvious one for me to pick is uh, Keith Wellers. You know, he's really he's made something out of nothing, which, you know, I think you always look for in the game, you know. But I really, apart from that one, I really liked Stan Bowles as well. I thought that the tremendous power shot was Bertinall's shot. You know, oh, that was really a great shot. I mean, he's, he's controlled it once and he's hit it from about 28, 30 yards and, and he's screamed in the back of the net. Yeah. Tremendous. See, John, John Richards was under an awful lot of pressure, probably the most pressure of the lot when he came, when he came to strike the yeah, ball. Yeah, people think it's easy you know. running from the halfway line, you know, but when you're running from the halfway line and you've got to think about where you're going to put it and the, there's Larry Lloyd running alongside him, That's another player coming in behind him, you know, he's, he was under tremendous pressure. It was a good goal, Richards as well. The best build up was the Queen's Park Rangers one, wasn't it? With Because it goes goalkeeper, winger, 40 yards run, centre, and then the three neat finish, back of the net. Was it yeah, three I or think, four seconds I think altogether? possibly Berner's right, but I think possibly the, the, best, the best single skill of the lot was possibly Dennis Stewart's, you know, I mean, volleying, you know, I mean... It's all strikers' dreams to, well, volley, I was say, to volley the same way as what Dennis Stewart did. That's you know, one you dream about getting, Mike, presumably. <coughs> and if you've got one, you say, well, I shall never get another one like that as long as I lace I up a pair of football. I don't think he will. I don't think he'll ever get another one. But you say like this that. about Keith Willis, can't you? Exactly the same. Yeah, but with Stewart, I mean, I say, not e it was so hard that not even a top-class goalkeeper like Shilton, Jennings or, or, or Clements could have got to that shot. It was so hard. It was so powerful. But that was, you can say that it's about Billy Bonds, I mean, no one would get for that shot, would they? Mm. No. no. But then again... Or Wellers or Birchfield. He was a skillful goal, Bonds was, the way it came across. Well, uh, body. after hearing you three, I'm not going to vote at all. <laughs> 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 well, I think it's terribly hard, because these are the, surely the best six that's ever been on this programme. It's been going now, this is the sixth year. And there haven't been better six than this. Vic, which one would you go for as the outstanding goal? Stan Bowles, Queen's Park Rangers. Mike? I'm tempted to go for Dennis Stewart, but I think uh, I must stick with Keith Weller. Malcolm? I'm going to... Uh, I like Stan Bowles' goal, so I'm going to vote for Keith, well Keith Weller. <laughs> <laughs> A burden. I'm torn 50-50 between these two, Weller and Bowles. Well, that conversation, and it was a fascinating one, went on for some time. Uh, but eventually the panel came up with this order of merit. What I'll do is I'll give it to you as we normally do, in reverse order, from sixth best down to the winner. The sixth best goal was goal F, scored by Billy Bonds for West Ham United against Coventry City at Upton Park. Holland. Here's the cross again, but only Robson is in there. Not in the way for Billy Bonds. The fifth best goal was goal D, scored by John Richards for Wolves in the League Cup against Liverpool. Call hoists it away. Smith under pressure. Richards away. Being chased by Lloyd. He got his shot in and a beautiful goal. What a spectacular goal. The fourth best goal was goal B. That was Alan Birchinall's for Leicester against Leeds United. The head tennis stops well out. Beautifully done, Weller. Stringfellow trying to knock it back to one of his own men. He wasn't there. Stringfellow gets another bite. Chance on for Birchin or the whack one. And it's a beautiful goal. What about that one with his left foot? Down to the top three. The third best goal A. Dennis Stewart, then of Sunderland. This one came against Oxford United. So it'll be another free kick to Sunderland with a chance for Kerr to uh, play the short one to Malone and now for Kerr to cross one into that Oxford penalty area. Oh, and a magnificent goal! What a tremendous goal by Dennis Stewart! Well, that is a goal of the season. The second best goal, it's goal C. It went to Stan Bowles of Queen's Park Rangers in the game against Wolves at Molyneux. Leaving it for Daly. A good head. Sunderland was the boy, got on the end of it. And Thomas absolutely streaking out for Rangers. Over the side is Bowles. Has he seen him? 
He has. He can't miss it, surely. He didn't. What a glorious move out. Which leaves us with the winner of the Golden Goals competition of 1974. So, the big match's top goal of the season, scored by Keith Weller of Leicester City in the Cup against Luton. Whitworth to Weller. Lovely, close control there by Weller. Still with Weller. Oh, and what a fantastic goal! And here's the man who scored it. Good to see it again, Keith. Very good, Brian. Yeah. I think before we talk to Keith, we ought just to remind ourselves of the winning order of the Golden Goals, and here it is. The winner, Keith Weller. Second, Stan Bowles. Third, Dennis Stewart. Fourth, Alan Birchinell. Fifth, John Richards. And sixth, Billy Bonds. Six really tremendous goals there. And an enormous response, as usual, from you, the viewers of the big match. The winning entry eventually came from Mr. George Zillini. Here it is, the actual entry that he uh, sent in to us. And Mr. George Zillini is, in fact, in here in the studio. Welcome to you, George, as well. Maybe we thought it would be a nice idea for you, a viewer, to present our Golden Goals trophy to the man who scored it, Keith Weller. Keith. Okay, thanks, George. Congratulations. It was a tremendous goal and fully deserves that trophy. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks. Is that the best you've, you've scored, Keith? I remember you came in after the... Uh, uh, after you yeah. scored it and hinted as much. You've not certainly yeah. scored one that's better than that this season. No, I don't, not, as, not one that I've got so much pleasure out of scoring, you know, because it it had the beating of the, f the players and the finishing off with the shot, you know. Mm. I mean, the other goals, all the goals were great goals, but uh, we thought Birch's was, was going to win it up until I got that one. Yeah. And then it was, you know, in the It's balance. interesting that the professional strikers have all said, yes, that's, that's the one. Uh, Mick Shannon, you heard there, yeah. said it. Uh, Martin Chivers, who couldn't come to our Golden Goals party today, said, uh, I'm sorry I can't come, but please tell Keith that's the one goal that I would love to have scored. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's a Mind pro's you, goal. He didn't get a bad goal against us yesterday, actually. <laughs> So, uh, no, it was, you know, it's one of those games and one of those goals that uh, they either go over the bar or they go in the net, Brian, you know, and uh, fortunately it went in. George, you, uh, why did you choose Keith's? Well, I like to see a goal with lots of control, and I think he controlled it all the way and then hit it into the top corner beautifully. You know, you couldn't get a better goal, really. As we can see on the caption, you came, you come from Hemel Hempstead, but I gather you're a Crystal Palace fan. Yes, that's right, yes. Tell us how that happens. Uh, well, before Christmas, we lived in South London, in West Norwood and uh, the ground is only 10 minutes away so I always went down there but I still go down there I've only missed uh, two games this season that's the right sort of support uh, you're, you're a games master at Hemel Hempstead are you? Uh, no uh, I help with the games sir. I get the worst job refereeing yeah is there very much dissent at that level do you find amongst the uh, not really no uh, the kids at that age don't do very many fouls so it's usually a very open game and not very difficult to referee. Do they know you're here today? Yes, they do, yes. How do they know that? Uh, the headmaster told them in assembly yesterday. He got rid of me and uh, told the kids. And when I came back, I was asked for so many autographs. <laughs> I, I know what Keith feels like now. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying a bit earlier, Keith, that's about the only thing Leicester City have won this season. Yeah, unfortunately, Brian, we, uh, we seem to shut our bolt, you know, right when it counted. We got to the semi-finals and uh, got beat by Liverpool. And we thought we were, you know, searched to go into Europe, but um, as I say, unfortunately, we've not played too well the last two months, and the results have gone against us. So we're out of that as well. So. What's been the cause of that? Do you think? I mean, you've got so many, you've played such beautiful football for so long this season. What what caused yeah. that little snap? Do you well, I think um, you know, not being nasty, but Frank and, and Stevie wasn't putting the ball in the back of the net as often as they were early on, and, and it you know it helped us out tremendously uh, in the midfield and at the back because they were scoring at, at will. But uh, they went through a little bit of a bad patch where they never scored uh, in about two months. And I think, obviously, if your top two strikers are not scoring, um, then you're going to struggle. You know, Lenny Glover as well. Although now we've, we've come back on song a bit. Yeah. Keith, that's marvellous. We're delighted you've got that trophy there. I've got another little trophy here that goes to uh, George Zeleny, which I'll give to you afterwards, George. Thank you very much indeed for coming in today. And, uh, Congratulations, and I hope you don't get to have to sign too many autographs when you go back to school. <laughs> but Keith, in fact, before you go, we've got another little duty to perform, which is the draw for the uh, London Five-A-Side Championship to be played at Wembley on Wednesday. Let's do that now. Yep. Right, Keith, here's the velvet bag with 12 balls. We better give it a good shake. 12 London clubs. The first eight that we draw out will play four first-round matches, and the final four will get buys and play second-round matches. 
So, here we go. Number three. Number three is Charlton Athletic, who will play... Number 12. Number 12, West Ham. Number, number six, six is Fulham. Number five. Who will play five, Crystal Palace. George's team. George's team. Number two. Number two are Brentford. Number ten. Playing Tottenham. Number one. Number one is Arsenal. Number seven. We'll play number seven, Millwall. They're the first round matches. The final four that are coming out, these four have buys into the second round. They will play each other in that second round. Number 11. Is Watford. Number four. Against number four, Chelsea, the holders. That's number, number nine, nine, Keith. Yes, yeah. number nine, Queen's Park Rangers. And the last one. And the last one out. Number eight. Is going to be number eight, Orient. So yeah, that's the draw for the London Five Size to be sponsored. Well done, Keith. Thank you very much. Thanks We've got a Golden Girls party to go to, so you can get there okay. before me. Thanks very much. Uh, being sponsored by the Evening Standard at Wembley next Wednesday. In fact, you can see the highlights of those Five Asides at uh, 10.45 on ITV. This then is the draw again, let's just remind. Charlton against West Ham, Fulham against Crystal Palace, Brentford against Tottenham, Arsenal against Millwall, that's in the first round. Second round buys, Watford against Chelsea, Queen's Park Rangers against Orient. Well, that's it. The last Saturday of the league season, but only the start of a big summer of football on ITV, of course, with the World Cup as the centre point to it all. But we start next Saturday with the FA Cup final between Liverpool and Newcastle, with ITV opening up at 11 o'clock and plenty to keep you excited and amused for the next six hours or so. So that's the Cup final on ITV as we say goodbye to another season uh, of the big match. Thank you very much for all your support throughout the season. And we leave you today with a moment when Dennis Law became a reluctant executioner, sent Manchester United into the second division. Have have you ever seen a man so unhappy about scoring a goal? Lee. Pulled across for Law!